Coming up on Arirang News. The earthquake death toll in southern Turkey and northern Syria surpasses 10,000, and there are warnings that the number of losses could continue to surge. Rescue teams from South Korea and from many parts of the world are desperately searching for survivors. Nationwide civil air and defense drills are to be held again in South Korea this May after a six-year break. This decided in a defense meeting led by President Yoon suk yeol to protect citizens in the event of an attack from the north. For the first time in South Korea's constitutional history, the National Assembly passes an impeachment motion for a cabinet member. This suspends Interior Minister Lee Sang-min from his duties over mishandling last Halloween's Itaewon crowd crush. Hello, it's 9 p.m. here in South Korea, and thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We begin this evening with the devastating earthquakes that hit southern Turkey and northern Syria. The death toll is now above 11,000, while close to 50,000 are injured. Rescue work is underway, but it's been hampered by hundreds of aftershocks, severe winter weather, and destroyed roads. Kim Jong-sil leads our coverage tonight. They're calling it a race against time. What were once roads and buildings are now rubble, where rescuers are looking for survivors. But the freezing weather means they don't have long. At this point, officials in Turkey and Syria have confirmed a combined number of at least 11,000 dead. The majority of the deaths in more than 8,000 are in Turkey. Reuters cited a UN official as saying thousands of the dead may have been children. The earthquake has cut off electricity and power, making it hard for rescuers to use heavy equipment. Also holding them back have been more than 450 aftershocks, heavy snow, and destroyed roads. The Gaziantep region, for example, saw temperatures on Tuesday as low as minus 6 degrees Celsius. Reuters reported Tuesday that more than 12,000 search and rescue personnel had been deployed along with 9,000 troops. International rescue teams and other aid are arriving from more than 70 countries. But since the quakes affected such a large area and the damage is so extreme, it's not clear that even this will be enough. Officially, nearly 6,000 buildings have been destroyed. The Turkish government has also set up a humanitarian tent city in Malatia province to shelter those who lost their homes. There in the snow, experts say survivors who are not yet rescued could die of hypothermia at any minute. The Turkish government has declared a state of emergency in 10 provinces for three months. The director general of the World Health Organization said on Tuesday that the situation in Turkey and Syria is now a race against time and called for international support. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. South Korea joins other countries around the world sending aid to the quake-hit region. In fact, it has sent its largest ever single contingent of relief personnel. A military aircraft carrying a team of more than 100 rescue workers landed there this afternoon. Our foreign ministry correspondent Pei Eunji has more. With thousands of people waiting desperately to be rescued following the powerful earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, more than 100 rescue workers from South Korea have now arrived in Turkey. Seoul's foreign ministry said the KC-330 military transport aircraft landed at Kaziantep Airport at around 7 a.m. local time. Kaziantep is one of the hardest-hit cities in Turkey. The aircraft carrying a 118-member rescue team, search dogs and medical supplies had left South Korea Tuesday night. This is the first time that South Korea has decided to send this many rescue workers at once to another country. Formed upon Turkey's request, the team mostly includes military personnel and firefighters. 
The temperature is falling below zero degrees Celsius with many people still waiting to be rescued under the rubble. We're worried that people could succumb to the cold weather if they're not rescued quickly. This comes after President Yoon suk yeol on Tuesday expressed his condolences and ordered officials to send a rescue team and medical supplies quickly, describing Turkey as a brother nation that sent troops to fight alongside South Korea during the Korean War from 1950 to 1953. Seoul's foreign ministry also announced that the government has decided to offer 5 million U.S. dollars in humanitarian assistance to Turkey. It added that it'll provide aid to Syria as well, once international organizations announce their humanitarian aid needs. Peunzi, Arirang News. Pope Francis has sent a message of condolence to the victims and rescue teams following the devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Taking to Twitter on Tuesday, the pontiff said he continues to pray for those who have died, the injured and their family members, as well as those involved in the rescue efforts. He also stressed the need for aid for the earthquake-stricken region. And according to the Vatican News on the same day, the Pontifical Mission Societies in the U.S. launched a relief fund to help victims in Turkey and Syria. The money raised will go to members of the clergy and missionaries who are giving assistance in the region. South Korea has decided to stage nationwide civil and air defense drills this May for the first time in six years. This as threats from North Korea continue. The decision was made on Wednesday in the presence of South Korea's commander-in-chief. Our Kim do has the details. South Korea is planning to revive the nationwide civilian air defense exercises starting this May, having not held the drill since 2017. In these exercises, civilians take part by stopping traffic and practice evacuations in the event of a North Korean attack. This, according to the nation's defense ministry, following Wednesday's annual Central Integrated Defense Meeting. Leading the meeting was President Yoon suk yeol himself, who was the first president to do so in seven years. And he made clear that it won't be the last time. <laughs> The meeting was attended by some 160 senior officials representing the military, police, coast guard, civilian affairs, and national intelligence bureaus. The authorities discussed an integrated approach to protect the public from North Korea's growing provocations. According to an official at the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the revived drills will be managed by the Interior and Safety Ministry, and each provincial-level government will have their own as well. In addition, the officials discussed the means used to alert civilians in the event of a North Korean attack, one option being mobile phones. They also discussed plans to install evacuation facilities in public buildings and large complexes, such as shopping centers and apartments, along with ways to protect the nation from the North's cyber attacks. Citing the data center fire last October that caused chaos by disrupting text messaging and other services, the authorities also discussed designating some of the nation's data centers as important national facilities, which means by law, the police will need to come up with defense strategies for them. The Central Integrated Defense Meeting began back in 1968, a year when North Korea infiltrated South Korean territory and tensions reached a historic high. Kim do Yang News. South Korea's first vice minister of foreign affairs, Cho Hyun-dong, will meet his American and Japanese counterparts next Monday in Washington and discuss regional and global issues, including North Korea. South Korea's foreign ministry announced on Wednesday that Cho will meet U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and Japanese Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs Takeo Mori to discuss various regional and global issues, including North Korea's nuclear provocations. Cho will also have one-on-one -on -one talks with Sherman and Modi after the trilateral meeting. This comes after the three met just over three months ago in Tokyo. 
U.S. President Joe Biden takes a hardline approach against China when it comes to U.S. sovereignty. This as he has delivered his State of the Union speech amid Washington-Beijing tensions following suspected Chinese spy balloon incident. Choi Min-jung tells us more. U.S. President Joe Biden said the U.S. would cooperate with its rival China, but at the same time protect itself. This was said during his State of the Union address on Tuesday local time, referring to tensions that flared after the Pentagon last week detected and shut down an alleged Chinese spy balloon. I'm committed to work with China where we can advance American interests and benefit the world, but make no mistake about it. As we made clear last week, if China threatens our sovereignty, we will act to protect our country, and we did. Biden also made clear that his personal conversations with President Xi Jinping last November sought competition, not conflict. With respect to economic competition, Biden said his plans to boost domestic manufacturing, including semiconductors, are helping the U.S. win. I will make no apologies that we're investing in, to make America stronger. Investing in American innovation and industries that will define the future that China intends to be dominated. Investing in our alliances and working with our allies to protect advanced technologies so they will not be used against us. Biden also denounced Russia's invasion of Ukraine and added that the U.S. will stand with Kyiv for as long as it takes. Also addressed during the speech were health care, climate change, gun control, bipartisanship and the improvement in the country's economy with regard to employment and inflation. Tuesday's speech was Biden's second State of the Union address since taking office. Choi min Arirang News. On Wednesday afternoon, the National Assembly passed a motion to impeach Interior Minister Yi Sang-min with the 179 lawmakers voting in favor. This makes Yi the first cabinet minister to be impeached by South Korea's National Assembly. Our political correspondent Yi si ho reports. South Korea's National Assembly on Wednesday passed a motion to impeach Interior Minister Lee Sang-min for an alleged lack of appropriate response to the tragic crowd crush in Itaewon late last year. This marks the first time a cabinet minister is impeached by South Korea's National Assembly. Lee is now suspended from duties until the Constitutional Court makes a final decision on whether to endorse the impeachment. In the meanwhile, the court will review whether Lee has violated the constitution or the law. The impeachment motion was introduced by the main opposition Democratic Party, the Justice Party and the Basic Income Party on Monday, 101 days after the incident that led to the deaths of 159 people. The motion, which requires a consent of one-third of National Assembly members to be tabled and half of the lawmakers to be approved, passed with DP holding the majority. A total of 179 lawmakers voted in favor of the motion. Before the motion was put up for a vote, the ruling People Power Party, Song Won Suk, suggested referring the motion to the Parliament's Legislation and Judiciary Committee for a review. Song explained that the impeachment does not meet the necessary legal requirements to be endorsed by the Constitutional Court. What law did Minister E violate? The police investigation did not find any violations and the prosecution is continuing its investigation based on the police's findings. On the other hand, the DP's Kim Seung won reiterated the minister's alleged failure to respond appropriately before and during the tragedy. Minister Lee, despite having the responsibility for disaster management and the crowd incident being forecasted in advance, did not take preventive measures. This is a violation of the Framework Act on the Management of Disaster and Safety. Meanwhile, the presidential office decried the passing of the motion. It's giving up on parliamentarism. This will go down as a shameful moment in the history of parliamentarism. Meanwhile, the Constitutional Court is expected to make the final decision within 180 days. The impeachment will be finalized if six or more constitutional judges out of nine vote in favor. Yi Shi-hu, Arirang News. 
South Korea continues to see a downward trend in the number of COVID-19 cases, even after the lifting of the indoor mask mandate. However, the authorities say it's not a time to let guards down, considering rising reinfection numbers. Jung Eun-ju with more. South Korea's overall downward trend in new COVID-19 infections continues despite the country lifting most of its virus curves. The government lifted the mask mandate for indoor spaces, except at hospitals, pharmacies and on public transportation on January 30th. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said at Wednesday's briefing that the number of new cases last week decreased by 24 percent compared to the previous week. The agency attributed the decline to the high level of voluntary adherence to COVID-19 preventive measures. The country also added fewer than 20,000 new cases for the seventh straight day. There were 22 COVID-19 related deaths and the number of critically ill patients was down 10 from the previous day to 283. The nation's COVID-19 reproduction index is at 0.90, below one for five consecutive weeks, indicating that the spread of the virus has decreased. Weekly COVID-19 risk levels were also at low nationwide for the first week of February. Presumed cases of reinfection, however, slightly increased from 22.8 percent to 23.03 percent in the last week of January. This means that one in four to five confirmed cases had already caught the virus before. Health officials said that the immunity of those who were infected during the spread of the Omicron variant may be decreasing and urged people to get booster shots. Meanwhile, Chi Young-mi, commissioner of the KDCA, said Tuesday that South Korea is considering lifting visa restrictions on travelers from China earlier than scheduled, as China has seen a steady decline in the number of COVID-19 infections. Those entering South Korea from China will still be required to undergo a coronavirus test before and after arriving until the end of this month. Jung Eun-ju, Arirang News. South Korea's current account managed to be in the black last year, but the surplus recorded was the lowest in 11 years. Kim hyun sung explains. South Korea's current account surplus last year shrunk to an 11-year low. According to the Bank of Korea on Wednesday, the surplus for 2022 was just 29.83 billion U.S. dollars, its lowest since 2011. It's also a 65 percent fall from 2021 surplus of more than 85 billion U.S. dollars, a surplus posted when the country was still struggling through the COVID-19 pandemic. Although the surplus has shrunk a lot compared to the year before, considering the high prices of energy, the economic slowdown in major countries and the IT sector's decline, the numbers came back better than expected. In fact, the surplus for 2022 is actually higher than the BOK's previous forecast of a $25 billion surplus for the year. Asia's fourth largest economy swung through ups and downs in its current account balance last year, seeing deficits in August and November. It was able to turn a corner in December with a $2.68 billion surplus from the roughly $220 million deficit in the month before. The central bank says that the narrow deficit in the goods account and an improvement in the main income account helped to bring the account back into the black. But the slowing global economy and the sluggish demand for IT products could mean a rocky future. The Bank of Korea said on Wednesday that with uncertainties continuing to brew overseas, the account balance may wheel through more ups and downs in the coming months. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. As one tech columnist has put it, searching the web is set to turn into chatting with the web. This reality comes amid the heated race for AI chatbots among tech giants. Our Song Yoo-jin reports. The AI arms race is fiercer than ever. Following the meteoric rise of ChatGPT, an artificial intelligence chatbot made by OpenAI, multiple tech giants are working to launch their own versions. ChatGPT rose to fame after its free public testing debut last November, with over a million users signing up within the first week. The latest company to release a chatbot is Microsoft. And it's a new day uh, in search. It's a new paradigm for search. 
rapid innovation is going to come. In fact, a race starts today in terms of what you can expect, and we're going to move. We're going to the company on Tuesday unveiled its revamped search engine Bing, equipped with AI chatbot technology at its Washington headquarters. With the updates, a list of search results is just part of what Bing provides. It will also answer questions, chat with users, and generate content in response to users' demands. Microsoft says its users will be able to fully access the service in the coming weeks. It added that it's also going to integrate AI technology into its Edge web browser. Microsoft's reveal comes a day after Google announced plans to roll out its own chat GPT rival, Bard. The CEO of Google and parent company Alphabet announced on Monday that Bard is open to trusted testers with plans to make the service available to the public in the coming weeks. Chinese tech giant Baidu is also joining the frenzy. The company released a statement on Monday that its chatbot project, dubbed ErnieBot, will likely complete internal testing in March before being made public. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Helping seniors improve their digital literacy is a crucial task on the local and national levels as this country faces an aging society and digital transformation. Our Shin Sebyeol covers some of the efforts aimed at boosting engagement between the elderly and their electronic environment. Digitalization. For some, it has indeed made their lives much easier and better. But that's not exactly the case for others the elderly. To ensure the digital inclusion of seniors, local governments and institutions are offering a variety of social services. One is the Seoul City Government's Digital Helper Service. These helpers assist seniors in using self-service machines for issuing civil documents at local district offices. Guided by digital helpers, seniors can handle the process smoothly. Using self-service machines is faster and more convenient than in-person service, but seniors feel intimidated operating them. I guide them to enter the correct information, allowing them to complete the process quickly. To ensure digital dropouts become independent in the modern digital era, digital education is also offered at senior welfare centers too. From web surfing to mobile banking, seniors are given opportunities to learn digital skills, helping them to make the most out of smart devices. In beginners' classes, seniors learn how to operate basic mobile apps, including how to send text messages and how to pull up emojis. Once they get used to it, they move on to the next level to learn more advanced skills, such as ordering groceries. I can now interact more with my friends and can even boast about it to them. Another major challenge is operating self-service kiosks as they replace front-counter employees at places like fast food chains and movie theaters. What used to be a huge challenge, however, isn't a problem anymore. They may seem slow, but they successfully get to the end by following instructions step by step. There was very little I could do with smart devices, but after taking this class, I feel so much difference in my daily life. Sometimes I feel like I can even do better than my kids. The digital divide for seniors is closing. They are taking baby steps in their tech journeys thanks to various efforts in place. An enriching life is within reach, with technology now accessible to them. Shin se Arirang News. Expect mild temperatures to prevail across the nation tomorrow. For the daytime, conditions will be close to what we normally see in early spring. But with a significant rise in daytime highs, big contrast in daily temperatures will follow. Most regions will see a gap of more than 10 degrees. While Seoul will see a gap of 12 degrees Celsius, places like Daejeon and Uisong will see even bigger difference. While central regions and the surrounding areas were under high concentrations of fine dust, Clean air will be restored for tomorrow. Air will be circulating at a much faster weight, which will help alleviate the fine dust. The entire nation will see air quality standing in the normal to good category. And partly cloudy to overcast skies are expected for the morning hours. Tomorrow, Seoul and Daegu will be starting off at minus 3 degrees. Southern parts of the country will see brief showers for the daytime. 
Highs and Seoul will get up to 9 degrees, Gwangju 11, Daegu and Gyeongju will be topping out of 10 degrees Celsius. And this coming Friday, the entire nation will see a mix of rain or snowfall. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world. This is where we wrap up tonight's newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news. Take care.